Um, on to our next speaker, who is Dr. Gregory um, Crocetti, and he is a microbial ecologist who's worked for CSIRO, Friends of the Earth, and is now part of an art, sorry, now part of an art science collective called Scale Free Network. In this Scale Free Network, um, Gregory and the other partners, partners Brini and Jackie, have developed a range of art science projects combining microscopes with drawing, molecules with sculpture, and many more things. So please make Dr. Gregory very welcome. Hi, everybody. When I say the word virus, what, association, what associations do people have? I reckon most people... Well, I reckon it would be safe to say that most people have bad associations, or at least would say that viruses are mostly bad. Villains of the natural world, perhaps. Well, like the scientist I'm going to present tonight, viruses can be, good, can be bad and can be good. It all depends on the context. The name of the scientist I'm going to present is Felix Durrell. Felix Durrell was a brilliant researcher. He co-discovered and pioneered the early use of, uh, a therapeutic use of bacteriophages, Bacteriophages are viruses that infect bacteria. Now, Felix Durrell, there's another few reasons why we could maybe consider him, or there's a few reasons we could consider him a villain. He was born in Canada. <laughs> he spoke French and lived much of his life in France. He sported a short pointy beard for much of his life. He was an avowed follower of Lamarck. And at one stage, he performed radical experiments with children with terrible controls. Oh, and he also collaborated with scientists in the Stalinist Soviet Union, but that's another story. <laughs> the story I'd like to tell about Durrell is how he was a bit of a righteous dick. <laughs> and he pissed off so much of the scientific community that he basically buggered his chances of winning a Nobel Prize, which he probably deserved for his discovery. The man was truly brilliant, but he knew it a little bit too well. So, a quick background. Durrell was born in Montreal in 1873. He spent, after high school, he went uh, around Brazil, Turkey, Greece, a bunch of other exotic locations for seven years, met his wife, had a child. By the age of 24, he realised that he should probably take things a little bit more seriously and be a bit professional. Decided to become a microbiologist, and so... He built himself a backyard laboratory, subscribed to all the main microbiology journals and taught himself how to be a microbiologist, as well as one might hope to in that time and place. But it did land him work fermenting and distilling maple syrup. Fancy that in Canada, working with maple syrup. <laughs> well, Durrell, another thing can be said about Durrell is that he had very, very itchy feet. Throughout his life and work, he travelled all over the world, from his native Canada, throughout Europe, Soviet Union, Africa... Uh, Asia, and at the age of 24, no, not 24, as the 20th century began, this young man headed to Central America. He put his self-taught talents to use for the governments of Mexico and Guatemala. He was basically uh, commissioned to develop industrial fermentation processes of agave cactus, our fibres from agave cactus, sugarcane, and a bunch of other crops. But Durrell was also a devout follower of the great microbiologist Louis Pasteur. And Louis Pasteur inspired Durrell to be really, really interested in the causes and prevention of bacterial diseases. And so during his time in Central America and South America, Durrell went into, well, he looked at a lot of the bacterial diseases of, uh, of pests of, of uh, relevant plants and animals of agriculture. And he actually pioneered some really successful uh, early use of bacteria as biological controls of locusts and other insects. But World War I began, and Durrell got his chance to work at the famous Institut Pasteur. So he headed to Paris and played a leading role in the development of millions of doses of vaccines for the Allied forces. Now, remember, it was Pasteur who himself, well... There's some scandal around what Pasteur did not and didn't invent, but Pasteur, who, who helped develop the early vaccines for anthrax, rabies, and other diseases, which were 
which was what was being developed at that time. And that led to great fame and fortune for Pasteur and the foundation of his institute. This time during the war, many researchers at the Institut Pasteur, that's French for Pasteur Institute, um, <laughs> lived in the laboratory. And they would spend the whole night there, sleeping the night there. Anyone who's done honours or a PhD knows what I'm talking about. Um, and during this crazy period, Durrell would sneak in little side experiments during what he called rare moments of leisure. And it was during one of these side experiments that he made his great discovery. In August 1915, 10 mounted infantrymen contracted severe hemorrhagic dysentery. And the microbiological investigation of this case was assigned to Durrell. Durrell quickly discovered and described the Shigella species uh, from, these, from these 10 men, which he inventively named Durrell. Um, and in the act of describing the Shigella, he also began to play with the possibility of creating a vaccine for this because dysentery was such a big problem at the time. And in the act of making vaccines at that time, uh, we often used the use of what's called a Chamberlain filter. It's a porous earthenware, porous earthenware device about yay big that allows bacteria to pass through, uh, sorry, it traps bacteria at the top and allows a somewhat sterile suspension to pass through. And that filtered suspension was thought to contain, contain uh, invisible bacterial products. And those products were, were meant to be useful for vaccines, and that was the basis of a lot of those vaccines. The Chamberlain filter was also uh, central in the discovery of viruses only a decade or two earlier, starting with the tobacco mosaic virus and then the vaccinia or the smallpox virus. And the Chamberlain filter had also been really interestingly uh, central in this recent controversy around hog cholera, where in addition to a bacteria, there was some invisible filterable agent that seemed to be involved. And Durrell, being the good scientist he was, had read and knew all of this stuff. So in addition to his other experiments with Shigella, he took, a few, um, he took a few samples of the filtered discharges from the, the infantry soldiers. Um, pleasant job um, <laughs> that would have been. And he mixed that back onto lawns of the Shigella agar on plates. And anyone who's done microbiology probably knows the experiment I'm describing right now. He mixed some of, these, some of this filtered sample back onto the uh, cultures. And when he went back the next day, he noticed that there were discrete zones of clearing on this lawn of agar. And he, so he described these as plaques, these, these cleared zones, um, because something, and something appeared to be killing the bacteria. He also discovered that if he took a few drops from these cleared zones and they would filter back, pass back through the Chamberlain filter and he could then put them onto fresh cultures of Shigella and, and kill more of the, of the bacteria. And it's not clear at this time whether Durrell was absolutely certain that he was dealing with a virus, but he did describe this invisible antagonistic microbe, as that's what he called it, as some kind of living germ uh, needing bacteria to reproduce. And so in his famous 1917 paper, he named these microbes bacteriophages, and the phage bit comes from the Greek phagein, uh, to devour or to eat. Now news of this discovery to other scientific groups during the war was understandably slowed down because of the war, but all of his colleagues around him at the Institut Pasteur were uh, very much uh, aware of this research, uh, and it led to a lot of scientific and feuds right around him. This started, the first of these feuds was with a Japanese scientist, Tamezo Kabeshima, who initially, after collaborating with Joel in 1919, then turned around and uh, published some results saying that the anti-Shigella agents were enzymes somehow produced by the bacteria themselves and definitely, definitely not living microbes. Another colleague, Alessandro Salimbeni, reported the attack of slime, uh, that it was the attack of slime-producing amoeba that were responsible for the killing of, of, the, of the bacteria. Now, Durrell, in typical style, quickly dismissed these results, but others weren't as easily convinced. Jules Bourdais uh, was, was then institute, uh, director of the Pasteur Institute in Brussels and had recently been awarded the Nobel Prize for his work on the role of antibodies and complement system in the human immune system. 
Bourdais was clearly threatened by Durrell's bold claim that bacteriophages were the true agent of immunity and moved quickly to try and understand what the hell bacteriophages were. He could repeat key aspects of Durrell's work, but he did some slightly different versions of the experiment and inadvertently discovered what is now understood as the lysogenic cycle of bacteriophages and became convinced that bacteriophages were enzymes rather than microbes or rather than viruses, which very conveniently for Bourdais fit into his immunology theories. Now, Durrell, in his true confidence style, very quickly dismissed this. And at that time, his work was receiving so much attention, hundreds of citations. Um, he must have been on top of the moon. And he was also demonstrating some successful use of bacteriophages in the treatment of uh, bacterial infections, including dysentery. But his contemptuous attitude was building more and more enemies around him, especially Bourdais, because Bourdais was inspired to, to get this guy back. He published a paper. He went back in the, into the literature and found this obscure paper from 1915 um, and called attention to it in the literature. In 1915, an Englishman, an English bacteriologist named Frederick Twart had published a paper describing glassy, transparent areas within a lawn of bacteria and that he could pass some of this active material from these glassy transformations back through a Chamberlain filter which would kill fresh cultures of bacteria. Tort had some expertise in growing viruses and indeed suspected that he was observing the action of viruses against these bacteria. But he wasn't sure and he concluded it might be a virus or maybe an enzyme or maybe an amoeba and had no further funding to pursue the research. And so that's where it ended for him in 1915. Now, news of Twart's discovery being brought up in 1921 made Durrell furious, and Durrell refused to share the limelight. He immediately went on the attack and started attacking uh, Twart and took the position that he hadn't observed a bacteriophage. Over the next couple of years, Twart and Durrell were both invited to speak at scientific, com at scientific conferences where Durrell worked very hard to downplay the significance of Twart's discovery. By all accounts, Twart didn't seem to be too concerned, but the Belgians, uh, Bourdais and his student André Gratia, published, well, they were, and they published multiple accounts um, describing the Twart and Durrell phenomena to assert they were the same, and looking back, uh, most scientific and historical reflections conclude that both of them were looking at bacteriophages and had described and co-described and discovered bacteriophages. But as the 1920s continued, the term bacteriophages stuck and Durrell was still receiving some acclaim and doing more tests. But his regular criticism of others' research and his refusal to acknowledge tort just did more and more harm to the man's career and to the concept of the bacteriophages. By the year 1930, the Belgian Gratia had restarted the tort debate in the Arnels de Institut Pasteur, which resulted in a series of heated articles between himself and, and Durrell. This was until Durrell took the extraordinary step of issuing a judicial order to force the journal to announce what by all accounts was a scientific duel. Now, many of you may be thinking of two guys in white lab coats with pipettes in holsters, backs to each other. Durrell's duel amounted to each side nominating an independent scientist who would work in an independent laboratory to try and repeat Twart's results, to prove once and for all if what he was describing was exactly, according to his paper, was a bacteriophage. The scientists went to work and repeated Twart's results, and so Durrell had lost the duel. And as they say, the winners write history, and in this case, they write the science textbooks, because for the rest of the 1930s, the science textbook, textbooks all more or less uh, viewed bacteriophages as enzymes, uh, according to Bourdais, the, the Nobel Prize winner. And it wasn't until the 1940s that the electron microscope came along and revealed the true organised structure of bacteriophages as viruses. And yet even then, when Durrell had been finally validated and proved no fewer than two Nobel laureates wrong, did he public, still publicly object to the term organised being applied to bacteriophages, a very, very reasonable term uh, for bacteriophages. 
Now, the tragedy for the science is that through, for, the, for science, and the real reason why Durrell, I think, should be considered a, a villain in spite of his brilliance, is that throughout the 1920s and 30s, progress and the understanding and the use of bacteriophages was massively overshadowed by personal feuds and by Durrell's inability to share the limelight with, uh, with Twart. Because once the 1940s came along, the meteoric rise of antibiotics massively overshadowed the use and, and all of the bacteriophage uh, relevance, except that which went into, uh, into all of the molecular biology discoveries for subsequent decades. But the use of bacteriophages in treating bacterial diseases was completely lost. Everywhere that is except Stalinist USSR. But that's another story. <laughs> Thanks.